our composite comments online. Um, and uh, for those who don't know our group, we are a working group of the Memory Studies Association. And our goal is to bring together scholars working on broadly understood post-socialist memory cultures, promote cooperation and provide a platform for exchange of ideas. And one of our uh, online, uh, one of those are our online seminars um, where we discuss publications in our field. This academic year, we would like to revive the seminar series and meet more regularly on first, first Mondays of each month. We are beginning today with the book No Neighbor's Land in Post-World Europe, Vanishing Others, edited by Anna Velagawa, Sabine Rutter, and Małgorzata Wukian. Um, the book focuses on the social voids that were the result of occupation, genocide, mass killings, and population movements in Europe during and after the Second World War. Historians, sociologists, and anthropologists adopt comparative perspectives on, uh, on those who now lived in a clean border. The lands. Its contributors explore, lo explore local subjectivities of social change through the concept of no neighbor's lands. How does it feel to wear the dress of your murdered neighbor? How does one get used to find colleagues and neighbors no longer being part of everyday life? How is moral, social, and legal order reinstated after one part of the community participated in the ethnic cleanses of another? How is order restored psychologically in the wake of neighbors watching others being slaughtered by external enemies? This book shed light, sheds light on how destroyed European communities, once multi-ethnic and multi-religious, experienced post-war reconstruction, attempted to come to terms with what had happened and negotiated remembrance. Uh, we have uh, four guests today, uh, Anna Velagawa, Sabine Wutar, and Małgorzata Wukianow, who are uh, the co-editors of this book. And we have also Anita Walke, who is our discussant today. Uh, I will briefly introduce our guests. Anna Velagawa is a sociologist and assistant professor at the University, um, at, the Institute, um, at the Institute of Philosophy and Sociology and po of, Polish, of Polish Academy of Sciences. Her work focuses on the individual and collective memory in Poland and Ukraine, and on the social history of the Second World War and the immediate post-war period. She is an author of Displaced Memories, Remembering and Forgetting in Post-War Poland and Ukraine, and Tur Dwór Niema Dworu, Reforval Rona Polsce. She also co-edited two other volumes, uh, The Burden of the Past, History, Memory and Identity in Contemporary Ukraine, and the book we are, we, which is uh, the, 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 our object of our discussion today. Um, uh, currently, she's the coordinator of the Polish part of the project 24th February 2022, 5 a.m. Testimonies from the War, which focuses on the documenting of uh, the Ukrainian experience of the current war. Our second guest, Sabine Rutar, is senior researcher at the Leibniz Institute for East and East European Studies in Regensburg, Germany, where she works as editor-in-chief and managing editor of Comparative South East European Studies. In 2022-23, she was an interim professor of global history at the University of Potsdam. She recently coordinated a thematic uh, cluster on nationally anti-communism and violence in the European Cold War, uh, published in Slavic Review. In her forthcoming monograph, Work and Resistance Under Hitler and Tito, Mining and Maritime Industries in Yugoslavia, 1940s to 1960s, she compares microhistories of industrial labor during World War II and the early Cold War. She is co-editor with Anna Blagawa and Małgorzata Łukianow of No Neighbors Lands that we are discussing today. Małgorzata Łukianow, our third guest, is an assistant professor at the Department of Sociology at the University of Warsaw and the Center for Research on Social Memory. Earlier, she was an assistant professor at the Institute of Philosophy and Sociology of the Polish Academy of Sciences and a research assistant at Chemnitz University of Technology. Uh, she's a co-chair of the Polish Regional Group of the Memory Study Association. Uh, she's the co-editor of the volume under discussion today. Um, uh, and the monograph on personal documents in the pandemic, pandemic. She's interested in memory studies, sociology of knowledge, and sociology of culture. She's currently conducting research on the Russian imperial heritage in Poland and discourses related to it. She's also collecting oral history accounts of war refugees from Ukraine to Poland within the initiative 24 February 2022, 
5 a.m. testimonies from the world. And, and uh, our discussant today is Anita Valk, uh, is, uh, who is the George uh, W. Lewis Career Development Professor and Associate Professor of History at Washington University in St. Louis. Valk's uh, research and teaching interests include World War II and Nazi genocide, migration, nationality policies, and oral history in the former Soviet Union and Europe. And, Europe. and she has published many articles and books, book chapters on related themes, her book, Pioneers and Partisans, an oral history of Nazi, Nazi genocide in Belarusia, uh, weaves together oral histories, video testimonies, and memoirs to show how the first generation of Soviet Jews experienced the Nazi genocide and how they remembered it uh, after the dissolution of the USSR in 1991. From 2014 to 2022, uh, Volker served as co-pi of the Holocaust uh, Ghettos Project reintegrating victims and perpetrators through places and events. And uh, NEH funded Endeavor of the Holocaust, the Geographies Collaborate, the Collaborative to develop its historical GIS of Nazi era ghettos in Eastern Europe. The current research project is devoted to the long aftermath of the Holocaust and World War II in Belarus. A recently published article named Testimony in Place, Witnessing the Holocaust in Belarus, offers some preliminary insight into this work. At the moment, Dr. Walker is looking forward to being a Maris Wodowska Kiris, a senior fellow at the Freiburg Institute for Advanced Studies and at Freiburg University in 2024. And now I will give the floor uh, to Anke Walker, who will introduce um, the book and uh, will uh, moderate the discussion with uh, our uh, with our guests, uh, the editors of the book, later with the whole audience. So, um, Dr. Walker, this is you. Uh, now the floor is you, yours. Yeah. Well, good afternoon, good evening. <clears throat> I don't know where everybody is here. It's still morning. Um, but thank you again for inviting me to join this discussion today about a book that I've kind of followed basically from its very inception <laughs> um, and was very glad to see it um, in, in print uh, last year when it finally showed up in my mailbox. And I actually brought it because I think we all need to see it because um, I actually want to talk about your cover choice at some point, um, which I find very interesting and you don't say anything about it. Um, so as... Um, Anna said, I'm going to briefly introduce the book, and I really am going to keep it short, um, because we're all on Zoom, and I think we're all kind of tired of Zoom in some ways, um, and then open up some questions that I developed um, for the editors, but I hope that they can also facilitate a conversation with everybody who's here today. Um, I also want to acknowledge that the editors uh, must have had a silent agreement to all wear stripes today, which is very nice. That you're easy to identify on the screen. Um, so the book, uh, No Neighbors Lands in Post-War Europe, uh, Vanishing Others, um, is an impressive collection of essays, um, many of which, but not all, that resulted from a, a conference in 2019 in Warsaw that I was able to attend as well. Um, and I think the book is impressive in a way that it uh, really provides a kaleidoscope of experience um, and memory uh, throughout Central and Eastern Europe that we haven't had so far. Um, so I really want to highlight that this is a, a very unique um, and very important contribution, I think, to a more general understanding um, of post-war Europe. Um, and I want to congratulate the editors um, on this collection and that I think really gives a very good idea about how different communities um, that used to be multi-ethnic and multi-religious uh, before World War II experienced post-war reconstruction, how they attempted to come to terms with the events um, and experiences during the wartime, during the occupations that um, they experienced in, in different ways, um, and also how they negotiated issues of remembrance um, and commemoration in the aftermath. That's kind of the conclusion of the book. So what happened uh, during uh, the war um, are, of course, um, a variety of very problematic um, things including occupation terror, um, genocide, mass killings, um, but also massive population movements. Um, and those population movements were all in some ways uh, related to, to kind of these different forms of violence, 
Um, but in other cases, also the result of border shifts, um, specifically at the end of the war, when the European geopolitical map basically was redrawn, um, often under the very concrete um, influence of the Soviet Union, um, but also the Allied forces more broadly as they were trying to negotiate a post-war order um, that essentially, as, at least that was the idea, would prevent further um, conflict um, and further military uh, violence um, and violence um, against different populations and then violence also within uh, communities. And I think, as we all know, that didn't work out quite that way. Um, there's um, quite to the opposite, as, as especially we see it um, since February 22, very concretely, um, tensions between ethnic, uh, different ethnic groups um, continue to kind of shape the experience of people who reside in the region. Um, but the book, um, I think, does um, a very good job in trying to come to terms and trying to account really for um, the experience of post-war reconstruction um, that had to address a variety of massive changes and transformations in these local communities, uh, including changes to the property structure, um, to the economic um, composition and the economic structure really of, of many of these communities, to social hierarchies and the social uh, relationships, social networks um, that existed in these communities. Um, but as uh, the editors um, also really point out in the introduction, it was also a shift in terms of norms and values that were shared uh, within um, these communities. Um, and thinking here in particular about the impact of violence um, and uh, the, 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 the kind of acceptance of violence as a tool to solve conflicts. Um, and I, I do want to make a connection here to the aftermath of World War I, where I think we saw very, very um, similar processes in, in many European countries uh, where violence had been much more accepted as, as a tool to resolve not only political conflict, but also within um, communities, within societies. Um, and so the study of the interwar period as a potential reference for, for kind of further work to, to really understand the impact um, of these massive changes after World War II might be a fruitful um, endeavor for, for the future. And, and I'm not saying that you need to do that, but it, it, I think it does open it up um, for further exploration in terms of the aftermath of massive um, military conflicts in, such as wars. Um, because it, it really provides a very detailed um, study of the impact of, of these massive changes, again, uh, that related to economic, social, um, but I think also cultural structures within these communities. Um, I think the book also stands out because it focuses on those who stayed um, and who try to um, essentially continue to live on in uh, this space of, of, of devastation and of destruction. Um, rather than only to kind of trace those who left, uh, which I think is, is what, what much of the scholarship often does, is, is to look at those who, who fled, who, who were forcibly removed, um, but really to look at the, the social relationships um, that continue to exist or that had to be reshaped, that had to be rebuilt um, at the end of the war. Um, and the volume does that by providing, I think, a very kind of multidisciplinary perspective. Right. I mean, we have contributors hailing from history, from sociology, from anthropology, um, but in, in the person of Sabina, also in terms of kind of film and, and kind of exploring more artistic um, production, which I think is a very uh, promising approach. Um, and I hope we can talk a little bit more about the, the role of art, both for the construction of memory, but also in terms of how to understand how people have made sense of, of massive um, political and social change. Uh, during the discussion today. Um, what I find very intriguing about the volume is, is really to focus on social dynamics, because um, I think we have we have quite a bit of um, scholarship on post-war settings, post-war contexts, but they often focus kind of on the legal and political um, dimensions. So looking at issues of retribution, looking at um, post-war trials, uh, what's often called transitional justice, um, even though whether there is actually justice is often the big question. Um, but here the, the, the view is really on the social dynamics, on the social life um, and how it was impacted by uh, primarily the removal um, of, of many uh, people. Uh, the book, obviously, No Neighbor's Lands, really points to that absence, points to that uh, removal. 
Um, but what I also find really intriguing is that it's a, it is, it's a very em emplaced narrative. It, it really focuses on distinct localities and locales um, and how they have been reshaped and how different communities and how different individuals, I think there's, there's often also very, very concrete individuals that emerge um, as very central to per particular um, processes here. Um, and, and gives us a very kind of deep insights in, into the, these local um, dynamics. Um, and if, if you kind of look at the, the volume as a whole, it, it seems like the editors were able to, to find contributors to, to touch upon pretty much all parts of, of Central and Eastern Europe. I mean, there's, there's very few uh, gaps, um, and I, I don't even want to describe them as gaps, because I think the topical breadth um, and, and specter of the book really makes good on, on some of the minimal um, geographical uh, desiderata that, that remain here. Um, and so we have contributions um, ranging from um, an, an investigation of the, the treatment of ethnic Germans in Kaliningrad, so the kind of Soviet parts um, that were occupied within Poland, uh, a place called Rapka in, in Poland. Um, we look to uh, Istria. Uh, we look at Poland and Belgium. We look at Galicia. Um, but we also go all the way um, to the Bulgaria, um, Slovenia, um, and the Czech Republic. And, and so I think that that volume, as I mentioned already, really, I think, fills um, a very important um, gap in uh, post-war studies, because many of these, what are often called smaller countries, have, have never really been um, discussed in those regards. So I'm, I'm very glad to see um, this um, array and, and this range of, of um, perspectives here. Um, one of the moments that the editors highlight in their introduction that I found very important was um, referring to Istvan Derek's um, statement that the disappearance of ethnic minorities who had uh, migrated eastward um, before the kind of early mid uh, 20th century um, and who were often legally, and I'm quoting here, were legally, economically, and culturally privileged over local populations. So thinking specifically about Poles in Ukraine, Germans in Romania and Russia, Hungarians in Romania and, and Jews in, in, in several countries, um, that all of these ethnic minorities kind of disappeared um, at, the, at the, the mid um, 20th uh, century. And that he described it as kind of the most important event in the social history of the region. And I think the, the book really um, supports that and, and, and really fleshes that out by, by really um, providing deep insights into the local implications and the local iteration of, of this process. Um, and I would like to kind of um, begin maybe the discussion with, with the editors by, by asking them about kind of some more general conclusions, because we have these very local um, studies here um, that, again, I think are, are very, very insightful. Um, but kind of thinking with Istvan Deag and in marking this um, disappearance of certain populations as as one of the major, if not the major um, event um, in Central Eastern European history of the 20th century, um, asking you kind of to to be his interlocutor um, in, in terms of the kind of the more general impact that these um, very localized um, processes had. Um, if we're thinking here in particular, um, about Central Eastern European history more broadly. Um, because I think one of the other uh, moments that I find very intriguing about the book is that it really challenges uh, the notion of liberation. Um, that, um, like I was I was born in East Germany, I, I grew up with this narrative of the end of World War II brought liberation um, across Eastern Europe uh, through Soviet troops that, that liberated the countries from German occupation, which is true. But on the other hand, of course, and started and began to establish new forms of occupation and, and new forms of violence ensued um, in the form of, of population resettlement, in the, in, in the form of um, arrests of political um, enemies or so-called so um, enemies. Um, and what I think this, this book really does is to, to, to shake that up. And to say we really can talk about this as as a moment um, of of liberation for major parts of the population in that region, um, and so so one question of course is it's, this book came out in twenty twenty three we had the conference in twenty nineteen why did it take so long right I mean if if you really think about how the Iron Curtain the so called Iron Curtain um, disappeared in in the early nineteen nineties um, but it's been thirty years 
Um, but to my knowledge, you, you really have produced a volume here that um, makes a huge impact in, in, in challenging that narrative that I have not really seen like that before. Like if, if you really put all these these local studies together into um, kind of a collective narrative um, of, of non-liberation, if you will. Um, so, so why did it take that long? Right. And, and how how do you position yourself in, in the larger field, essentially, of, of, of Central Eastern European history here? Um, and then again, very similar to, to my first question, what are the larger implications really for, for, for the understanding of Central Eastern European history if we use your book and, and the, the, the kind of contributions to, to the book as contributions to the larger history and, and not only quote unquote as contributions to thinking about the immediate post-war period and the reconstruction after World War II, right? Um, and then maybe for just to, to um, wrap up here, and, and I have I have a, a number of more further questions, um, but obviously we, we're looking at a drastically different um, situation in the region at this point um, with the beginning of the war in Ukraine. Um, the conference took place again in, in November 2019, and you started for work on that volume shortly thereafter. And so that was before COVID. Um, it was also before the massive wave of protests um, and ensuing political repression in Belarus. It was before Russia's assault on Ukraine. Um, so, so what two questions um, emerge very concretely. How can your book um, really help us maybe understand what is going on in the region now? And it doesn't have to be limited to these events in 2020 and 2022. Again, the conflict or the war in Ukraine really began in 2014. Um, and we have a number of other um, political crises in, in the region, including the rise of populism in Hungary. So, so how can how can thinking about the, the post-war period help us really grapple with, with what is going on nowadays in Central and Eastern Europe? Um, and then, of course, the other question: What would the book look like now? Right? Would would there be a different focus? Would there be different contributions that you think should have a place? Um, in in light of of what what we're um, looking at in, uh, in in Eastern and Central Eastern Europe right now, um, are there maybe contributions that you think should have a place there? Would you frame your own conception of the volume differently? Um, so how how would the kind of present situation um, maybe reshape uh, the book if you had the chance to do that? And I'm not saying you need to do that. Um, but I think it's often helpful to think about our own work in terms of the present, because I think we're all dealing with with history in order to make the present better in a way. At least I hope so. Um, so maybe that's it for from for for now from me. And again, I have a number of other questions, but but maybe the editors can can kind of start us off with some comments here. Who's going to start? <clears throat> Shall I? Uh, mm. me, Sabina, you, yeah, no, no, go no. on, me. Okay, <laughs> okay. So I will start with the issue of the cover image because, unfortunately, our wonderful publisher forgot to include the information, uh, the proper information about the cover image in the printed version of the book, which is such a shame because it was not accidental, as you can imagine. So uh, Sabine has already posted the information on the chat, and uh, so the this is a this is a piece of art uh, by contemporary Ukrainian artist Daria Zaseda, and it was it was chosen uh, on purpose. Uh, we wanted to have a Ukrainian, uh, well. We wanted to have um, somehow something Ukrainian on the cover and you, we wanted to link our book with what's happening now in Ukraine. And here I think I'm already starting to answer your uh, your questions about the book in the context in the context of what's going on, what's going on now in Ukraine. So I think that the the image for for all three of us, for all editors, uh, somehow, uh, well, tells the story of the neighborhood in a in a pill because you have the house, you have the house, and you have this feeling that there is something. It's really quiet, and it's going to be changed soon. At least this is my impression. That was my impression when I first saw the this piece of art, and I I saw it, and I thought, 
wow it's i mean not that much not that much has changed uh, since the the period that we worked on uh connected with these stories uh comparing with now so um yeah so it's it's ukrainian piece of art and indeed we started working on this uh, on this volume before the war started, uh, the war against Ukraine was started by Russia. Uh, and uh, I don't know whether this book would be different if it was uh, somehow being, if the, the idea was being developed now, but uh, I received some feedback from my fellow Ukrainian colleagues who, who told me that you know uh, when we are when we are thinking now about the issues of the neighborhood about the issues of the post-war reconciliation and post-war reconstruction we think that is coming that it's coming and um, the big fact is that we all were somehow sure that it belongs to the past I mean the reconstruction the all the issues of the um you know bringing back the the moral order by by the trials the collaboration issues the collaboration problem uh it all seems somehow to belong to the past and now i'm discussing it with my colleagues uh concerning the testimonies that i'm conducting that i'm uh, gathering now and they're asking me, so are you sure that you want to ask about the collaboration uh, <clears throat> in your recent, in your currently recorded interviews? Because it's going to be difficult. Are you going to ask? Are you going to ask about the names? Because this is going to be really sensitive data. So we are going to face trials. Uh, I don't know. I mean, they are going to be different from the trials that our authors are describing in the book, but it's going to be about the same, about bringing the justice and the moral order. And also it's going to be about the neighborhood, about the neighbors who are uh, who are failing the neighbors, uh, because some are. Uh, whether we treat Russia as the neighbor of Ukraine, as the state, or whether we treat, uh, well, Ukrainian citizens who somehow uh, welcomed the Russian troops in the east of Ukraine. I mean, not so many of them, but some, yes. And so in the deoccupied territories of Ukraine, it's, it is a very current issue that seems to belong to the past. Um, uh, and uh, I might, because I don't want to take so much time from my fellow co-editors, but I um you ask about the, the the general conclusions and the the larger implications and i think that and about and and you also asked why this kind of book was only published now uh like 30 years after the fall of the iron curtain and i think that i i, I have a kind of answer i think that uh speaking uh, as a citizen of of a country that was on the other side of the iron curtain i think that we first uh, needed to somehow took care about uh, other topics <laughs> and there was no space for all these issues of complicity of the inter-ethnic violence and of this, uh, well, brotherly conflicts and, uh, uh, and neighborhood violence because it was so, so painful uh, and it somehow needed time uh, to be addressed properly. And I think that <clears throat> in many well countries and in many circles there is still not enough space for addressing of these issues and you see it when you when you think about the reactions uh to the scholarship on the collaboration in the holocaust in poland in hungary also in ukraine that's a separate topic uh how much entitled to address the issue of the collaboration of your own nation to the holocaust Eight years ago, uh, you are if you have a war in your own country. That's that's another problem that I, I'm not going to answer this question because the Ukrainian colleagues should answer it. Uh, but somehow I think that uh, uh, the the most 
important thing that I learned from being editor of of this book because uh, I I learned a lot because I I'm I'm special I'm specializing in Eastern Galicia and I I think that I knew almost nothing about Bulgaria or Romania uh, in terms of the topics that that were addressed in the book. So what I learned uh, is that indeed this neighborly violence was so painful that uh, you know being being uh, discovering that a neighbor is is a traitor was so much painful uh wherever you uh you had a look on so okay so that's in short uh there are many many other uh well plots i could discuss but i will now pass the voice to zabine and Małgorzata, and we can continue later thank you shall, shall i yes I... please go ahead okay um yeah, I think Anna has almost said it all, but um, maybe just some some addition or, or supplements to, to what she was saying. Um, you asked about the difference, whether the book would have been different if we had started to do it now with everything that has been happening over the, the past year and a half or so. Um, and I think in a way we we ended up being in, in, in these events because if you read the the conclusion that we wrote, um, we're finishing it with a quote from from Vladimir Zelensky because we wrote it when we were like, I mean, in the meantime, we've all kind of gotten, we're going on with our lives and, and kind of have even gotten used to it. But at that moment when we were writing the conclusion, we were just totally out of our minds because we were like, okay, yeah. And um, part of this was that now the stories that are being told in our book are becoming either difficult to tell or even oblivious in the sense that now that we have now more pressing issues to deal with maybe and who's going to speak about the second world war at all and then you start hearing about holocaust victims dying in ukraine and this new war etc so it's all interlinked in a way that is really very painful i think anna is totally right and she, and one could add layers of pain to this and as a conclusion to this i would i would still say that it's all the more important that we continue pointing out the links between that time and our times because they exist and strongly so um and and the second thing i find it very interesting that you ask about uh Ishvan Deak in 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 the introduction um and not about the central concept of the book which is the neighbors but the two are of course very much interlinked yeah um the concept of neighbors is a very broad one and Anna just said a little bit about it we could we could um go more in depth i think but uh it is neighbors that are of a different ethnicity, of a different social standing, of a different um, state, if you want, if you look at, look at it larger, um, borders changed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's a very complex uh, concept in which we kind of try to engulf everything that 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 happened and or that the complex context requires, which I think includes also your question about liberation versus occupation the sequence of events that led to to another dictatorship and more pain and more suffering etc i think it's all in this concept in the end because if you use these um, over politicized concepts i think it's very it's very hard to do uh, and be still understood or not put in one ideological corner and because the post-socialist societies if you want to still call, call them that way they have nationalized in a way that makes the conversation that we want to have in our book ra rather more difficult maybe now than maybe it would have been even 15 years ago i don't know um yeah okay i finish here so um let me just add a few more things because i think a lot has been um a lot have been said um already um so I, because the book is based on micro studies and micro history. So I think it's also the lesson also maybe in terms of current events, because, for example, concepts and currents like geopolitics, they are, of course, making the great career these days and seeing this macro processes happening. But I think this book shows that the micro stories have their own dynamics and they don't always follow this big currents and big chain, um, big chain of events. 
So uh, what um, I think both uh, Anna and Sabine mentioned, that there are certain nuances to all the histories. And I think this is something to draw attention to, that what are the different dynamics that could be seen um, why and why it's now. Um, so I think now it's it's already obvious and we have a lot of thinking tools and concepts for transcultural frameworks, for transnational memories. And this is how how we tend to frame many um many works and of course this volume uses a lot um uses this perspective a lot and this is of course a very fruitful um uh, fruitful for perspective and as i said we tend to think right now of this as a very obvious thing but once like during working on this book when you see it happening when you read these articles and you see similar processes emerging this is of course striking and very um, interesting. And um, something to learn for today, I would say that um, Sabina mentioned layers of pain. And um, if, I, if I was to add something to it, is how certain layers of pain are all, also silenced in memories, in, in official politics, in personal memories. Who is being silenced? So this is perhaps maybe, just maybe, a lesson that we can learn, like, to whom should we listen not to omit these layers of pain that have been uh, omitted in public uh, memories for a very, very long time? Yeah, and I just want to make, make sure that this, 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 this um, is clear that I was not saying this in a, in a way by, by way of accusation that it took 30 years. I think it is just an interesting question when, when certain questions can be asked. And I think it has a lot to do with generational dynamics, right? I mean, I think um, I think we're all in somewhat in the similar generation. And I think we can ask different questions than, there, than it would have been possible in the 1990s. In addition to the fact that, of course, the process of transformation in, in Central and Eastern Europe in the 1990s, uh, many, many other things were very, very, very important. Um, and on the other hand, I think we also need to think about the availability of archives, right? I mean, many of the of the um, contributions draw on archives that were just not accessible for a long time, um, and that slowly have become accessible, and now we're kind of working through them. So I think there is um, both a generational question um, in, in terms of kind of the, the archive that we can access, um, and, the certain, and the questions we can ask, because I, I mean, I, I come out of the German context, and obviously it took several decades um, for, for German society to um, face face up, if at all, um, to, to the Nazi past and to, to, to German society's participation in incredible forms of violence. Um, so I think there is, there is, I mean, there is, I think some scholars have actually written about how long it often takes um, and, and really pointed to the gener generational dynamics um, in, in this regard. Um, and because Sabina pointed out that I didn't mention anything about the neighbors, I was going to talk about that later, um, because I think it is it is a major, major topic, obviously, I mean, it's in the title. Um, and just reading the title, obviously, as, as someone who encounters the book, uh, what immediately comes to mind is Jan Gross's work, Neighbors, right, talking about Yedwapne, and it seems like several of the case studies, especially the one about Rapka, but also some of the other ones, it seems like it's, it's Yedwapne all over again. Right. I mean, it, it, it's really neighbors turning against their neighbors uh, in incredibly violent ways. Um, it also brings to mind, thou shalt not kill thy neighbor. I mean, it's, it's kind of one of the basic moral commands that, that we assume humanity shares and that has been drastically challenged um, during a time like World War II and during the Nazi genocide and during the Holocaust. Um, but we can also think about neighboring countries, right, which, which lifts the question into the political sphere. And you already mentioned uh, that with regard to, to the war in Ukraine. Um, and, and one of the things that, that I kept thinking about um, some of the, the articles was that many of the interneighborly relationships that, that you talk about between Poles and Ukraines in particular, uh, they now have become politicized in, in the sense that these people now live in, in separate countries, right? So the individual relationships have become political relationships. Um, and so the book really touches on, on, on these dimensions in very intricate ways um, and uh, is connected to many, many other things. Um, and just um, what, one of the exercises I did in, in looking at the book was to kind of create kind of a, a word cloud. 
Um, Because it's often, I think, helpful to figure out what are are some of the main concepts that travel through the chapters and alongside neighbors. um, One of the central terms, I think, for for you, especially as you talk about it also in the introduction, is vanishing. It's really the disappearance um, of of certain groups of people um, and, and what that means. You talk about displacement and and talk about both physical dislocation, so people moving from one place to the next, but also kind of the more internal disorientation, right? Even for those who stayed, felt displaced because their surroundings, their environment was was so drastically different than it was uh, before and the impact that that had. Um, We read a lot about intimate violence, right? The very intimate violence within the communities, uh, to, to bring in one, one of the terms also that Omar Bartov has made really prominent in his work on communal violence. Um, so talk about the violence within uh, particular communi- communities. Uh, there's a lot of absence, there's a lot of voids, but there's also a lot of memory. Um, and I want to talk a little bit more because of also where, where this um, takes place today, thinking about the the kind of dynamics of memory and the mnemonic practices um, that that shine through, um, that are not always kind of at the center of the chapter. Um, but I think uh, in, in, in contrast to, to all the absence and the disappearance and the voids that, that many contributors write about, we also learn about the memory, right? Um, so I'm curious kind of to, to hear a little bit more about how you think about memory um, and how it is shaped by this relationship to, to what is not there. Um, and, and what are some of the kind of very crucial practices and responses that, that you see kind of across the region um, in, in terms of acknowledging and recognizing the, these absences? Um, but even in, in their absence, they're kind of present if that makes sense. I mean, I think it is it is both a dynamic of, of not being there and being there at the same time. Um, and in particular, because you make some of these things present with your work, right? So you're both st- scholars of memory, but you're also producers of memory in a certain way. That wasn't a real question, it was more an invitation. You wanna start again, Anna? No? Shall I start? <laughs> um, um, the last question I leave for, for, I wanted to comment on two things that you said before, um, but maybe it's connected even to, to memory because you, um, I mean, I'm, I also was socialized in Germany and we know how long it took before people started talking um, about things that happened without uh, self-victimizing, pushing away, etc. But still, I think that there is something else that should be mentioned about the the 1990s, which is um, the triumphalism of the West, in a way, which was so much imposing or thinking it could impose uh, its narratives. And, well, now these societies on the other side of the Iron Curtain are just going to catch up and become like us, etc., etc., and I think what was really missed out on, and I say this by way of really flawed memory politics on the European level, was to, to engage in a real conversation and to seek real understanding or even differentiation many times. It was all, I mean, even today, as I said before, if you say, I, I don't know, Trieste, Trieste was, was it liberated by Tito's partisans or occupied? Yeah, You can go into big fights in Trieste about that today. Yeah, and Trieste is not, it was the West after all, right? <laughs> so so I think there is, in, in terms of memory politics, there are many things where I would have wished for a more equal standing, more listening to each other, etc., which has never happened because of, yeah. And then, I mean, the nationalization of the formerly communist uh, societies didn't help either, of course. Yeah, if they just just have a nation nation state approach to history that's not good either and but that's what happened that's what filled the void that communism left etc etc and then another small comment on on the neighbors i didn't say it was wrong it was just surprising um, that you that you picked out there and didn't go right away into the central concept but i wanted to simply add i mean yes thomas gross's book of course and and it has echoes in the book very much so um but we have another decade, which I mean, the 1990s were also the decade of the Yugoslav wars. 
which have been pushed so much into oblivion with the war on terror and everything that happened ever since. Um, but here also there was there were books, there is research, and the big question: why the heck did neighbors turn against neighbors literally in this war as well? So we have this this thread of of puzzlement about why this happens. Neighbors should be you're saying you're citing the Bible. Yeah, you're right. So so it is it is a very pertinent topic and and what Anna said before is quite chilling. You know, like about what are neighbors in Ukraine and how can how can this be reconstructed when this horror finally is over in what way ever, etc. Um, yeah, but the memory specialist here is Margot Jatta, of course. So. Oh, thank you. I, 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 I'm not sure how um, how much of a specialist I am, but the, the way I try to look at this memory is this idea of Oleg's theodicy, meaning how can we come to terms with good and bad existing in the same time and how can we explain that something evil existed um, in the past? And I think in this post-conflict areas, this is the major memory work that's happening. Why something evil has occurred uh, when everything was or used to be fine, which is also another uh, another way of um, presenting um, presenting the past. And and suddenly an explanation that emerges, and it's important what Sabina mentioned, that the nation state steps in and also the memory framed as a national memory. So what you can see, so we don't sometimes, uh, oftentimes maybe, so we don't have neighbors or inhabitants, but there are, for example, representatives of one nation and another nation. So the memory steps also steps to this national level. And this memory is, of course, very antagonizing, meaning it crystallizes identities. It goes to this black and white, um, uh, black and white narrative. So uh, what is really missing from the picture is this living together in um, in some place and sharing certain certain spaces because the, the thinking that emerges is what is the story of one nation and another nation. Um, and and I think this is not something um, that that is gone from to, from today's memory as well, maybe referring right now to what is happening in, in general in um, in many memory politics in Central Europe, sometimes in Western Europe as well, this particularism in memory that we tend to see victimizations, in terms of a specific experience of given one um, nation state. I mean, just when, when you mentioned Western Europe, one of the things I was um, thinking about or reflecting on um, and, and reading many of the contributions is to how similar many of the processes um, that, that are described here actually are to what happened, let's say, in France, in, in West Germany, in the Netherlands. Um, were especially members of the Jewish community had to fight really, really hard for for returning any of their property and, and being able to move back into their homes, right? So in that sense, um, especially the Jewish experience, I think uh, across the European continent um, is 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 tragically similar um, if if you really think about it. And then the question, of course, is does that mean all of these societies are deeply impacted by anti-Semitism? Or is there something else going on that facilitates um, the, this, this form of rejection? Um, I'm, I'm thinking here about a text that I will teach next week in, in my class on the Holocaust about France and, and the return um, of Jewish survivors who found their apartments occupied by French neighbors and, and there was no, no recourse. There was no mechanism for them to, to be able to return um, to their former sites of homes um, and, and even um, belongings that they had left behind, right? Um, and, and so some of the contributions, I think it was specifically about um, Hungary, um, that, that talked very, very deeply about the, the struggles that, that people had to um, undergo and after after being heavily traumatized, right? I mean, it's just like a second traumatization. Um, and, and so one of the things I was thinking about, what would be a comparative perspective look like? And I think your book really lends itself to that. So I'm, I'm somewhat curious um, whether you kind of place yourself into this larger conversation um, of especially post Holocaust um, work, um, but I think we can also look at other ethnic groups 
Um, or, or do you see yourself really more contributing to Central and Eastern European history? Um, but I think you had other comments because your hands went up really quickly when I began to speak. So, Lana. Yeah, if I can jump in, I I, I first want okay, I I start with with your current question. So, uh, we we don't have uh neither Central nor Eastern Europe in the in the title of our book, and that was also not accidental because. Uh, from the very beginning, we wanted to include a wider geographical context because, because we believe that it's it's not only about Central and Eastern Europe, and uh, there is this contribution about uh, about uh, of of Mach of Machtelt Wenken, uh, which is about uh, which is about Belgium. But um, I also <clears throat> um, when I was doing the preliminary reading, uh, not not yet for this book, but for my larger project on this void <laughs> uh, in Eastern Europe, uh, I was looking for comparisons and I I read an absolutely marvelous book uh, by Almar Baum, who wrote about, uh, oh gosh, it was Algeria or Morocco. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't remember, but, uh, <clears throat> but, what was important was that I felt somehow, and the, the Jews left. They were not. They, I mean, they were not killed, but they left for for Israel in the sixties. But I really felt uh, at times that I'm reading about my Eastern Galicia when when he was describing the the changes in the economy. So uh, I had this feeling that from the beginning that it's not only about Central and Eastern Europe. It's about neighborhood, which might be a very universal phenomena. And also, I'm so glad that it's not only about Central and Eastern Europe because it's somehow, uh, you know, there is this um, in Western academia there is this way of thinking about uh, Eastern and Central Europe about as about this uh, this Snyder's bloodlands uh, where everything bad happened. So they had this awful ethnic cleansings and holocaust happened there and when the Jews returned there were the pogroms and the locals didn't want to give back the property but now we are bringing the case of France and I and there is a vast scholarship about how it looked in other western uh, uh, European countries after the war so no pogroms but this very reluctant attitude to bring, to, to giving back the property so I would say it's not about the Central Europe specificity. It's not. It's not. It's even not about anti-Semitism. It's much more about the very universal uh, reluctant reluctance to uh, well to give to to give back what was what was stolen. Uh, a very nasty universal feature, <laughs> which can be unfortunately discovered in many regions of the world. And I, I uh, just briefly want to <clears throat> address uh, address uh, one of the issues that you brought uh, to the table uh, a couple of minutes ago. So I think that I also think that this book could not be authored uh, twenty years ago because what happened in between was was the testimony turn in in historiography, the the witness turn in historiography. When you when you have a look. At the at the contributions of this volume, you see that the the testimony, uh, whether it's all or oral or it's, or it's a memoir or it is a trial testimony, it's in the center of of the um, of the methodological methodological approach uh, of of most authors, if not all authors. Uh, so you look at the person, you look at the personal, you you look at the biography to understand. The, the broader um, uh, complexity of, of events. And uh, I won't talk much about the memory. I will maybe just say that um, I'm a memory scholar. Uh, I mean, it's my background. I, uh, I was, uh, I got the training as sociologist, but I never felt I'm the real sociologist because I don't know much about the statistics. So I always uh, uh, had the feeling that okay, I, I'm. It's it's much more about identity and memory and cultural stuff. But 
this book somehow saw my evolution and my my way from the memory studies to the field of social history and uh, i think that also when we were working on the introduction with sabina it was quite clear for us that um uh, well the memories i mean it, the memory is important for this book but it's it's it it comes in the in the very end it comes in the very end and uh, first you need to somehow face all these studies which deal with uh, what happened yeah yeah Marco Shata, do you want to continue um, just just a short story about um, uh, comparing memories between east and west and north in this case so um, you mentioned this conference 2019 that was um, um, that was fundamental for um, for this book. It was also no neighbors uh, land. Um, and the presentation that um, I had because it was a different uh, topic, it was a comparison between Poland and Finland actually on the topic on lost territories. Um, because Finland also lost territories to the Soviet Union after the war. And um, the story was that I was attending a conference in Rome and talking about the politicization of this memory of lost territories. And there was this woman doing like this all the time I was talking. And she was the next speaker and she spoke about Finland using identical framework, maybe a little bit different words on that. And that was also striking that um, sometimes we tend to refrain from this kind of comparisons because the, the East Central Europe is this Leah the memoir. And um, why, why go broader if we can do this internal comparisons as well? But actually, if we look beyond, um, of course, Finland is also the case of being Finlandized and somehow also in this political sphere of the um, of the Soviet Union after after the war. But this is possible. And this is not, not impossible just because of thinking that this is um, an orientalized Eastern Europe that has to be, as Anna mentioned, um, the bloodlands um, that have their own uh, their own specificities. Yeah, no, I think Karelia is, is a very important example here to, to think about many of these processes that are very, very similar. Um, I, I believe, how, how much time do we have, Anna? Um, do we have like another 20 minutes or? Yes, of course. Uh, we can uh, we can stay until seven thirty here. Okay, because um, I have maybe one one or two more questions, and I would like to open it up for 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 the audience um, to, to see if, if there's any any question. Um, Sabina, I know you have your hand up, and maybe I'm just going to give you my question. <laughs> it was really specifically thinking about your chapter, uh, which is the only chapter that really focuses on one particular film. There there are some that that mention kind of films um, on the side, um, but I was kind of struck by by your analysis um, of the film. Um, and uh, was was kind of hoping that we can talk a little bit more about the uh, contribution that that art um, can can really make to um, or artistic production can can make to facilitating some of these processes of of memory um, and remembrance and commemoration. Um, because I think the the film that you talk about, and I should have written down the name. Um, find it really quick. Oh, like the town that it plays Piran. Piran, Pirano. Yeah. yeah. Um, raises many of the questions that, that many of the other kind of more sociological, anthropological um, articles uh, raise as well. Uh, but of course, it finds its own language to do that, right? And then I think you, you really pull out very nicely how it works around issues of, of home and belonging and identity. Um, so on one hand, the question is, what can art, what can artistic production contribute to engaging with these issues so to speak on the ground um because you you also talk about kind of the mixed reception that the film actually received in slovenia um where it was was not necessarily that all that welcome um, from what i gather um but others on, on the other hand also kind of for us to think about what purchase we could get for the study um, of memory by turning to artistic production right so as in, and again thinking about us as, as memory scholars um, so kind of two, two questions, contribution that art can make to memory, but also what can we learn from analyzing art um, that talks about issues of memory? Yes, thank you. Um, in fact, I was going to to say to, to talk anyway about my chapter and and and, and the, because you were you mentioned the 
the issue of return yeah and the, in france and how difficult it is to get back what belongs to you and that's exactly what the film is about it's about property um, about an apartment it's not very historical in the sense that it's very unlikely that people who met during the war then meet 60 plus years later and again struggle about the same apartment but that's the metaphor of the film of course um and um yeah i think i mean the the recept it's a film about it's a small town a venetian town in, in istria in, in piran um where at the end of the second world war um when i think about 90 to 95 percent of the ethnically Italian population left. Um, and it's a big issue until today about return, pro not, not so much anymore about property, but but about the legacy of that and about what town Piran is. And, and then it became Yugoslav and other people came in and it changed texture, etc. So, so it's really, I think it's a good example that kind of also speaks to your example and your question about anti-Semitism and your example in France, because I think Anna is right, we deliberately did not put Eastern Europe on the cover because no, this container is not what we want to talk about, but rather we want to entangle these stories because um, I think the Holocaust and anti-Semitism is, is very much and rightly so treated as one thread in this event, these events. And if there is a place where this doesn't work 100%, it is Eastern Europe because you have so many other cleansings and and murder and and antic antagonisms, et cetera, between other ethnic groups. Um, to the point that um, I once organized um, a conference on the Second World War in Southeastern Europe at the Topography of Terror Documentation Center in Berlin, which is the German memorial center of the perpetrators. And there was um, the opening event and a colleague from France went up, he was on the podium, and he said this sentence, he said, the Holocaust is not important in Southeastern Europe, and you could literally hear the mostly German, but international audience gasping, because you, I mean, you cannot say that in this place in Berlin, right? But he was not so wrong, yeah, because what is more important in, in Yugoslavia today or in successor states is, was it the genocide against the Serbs or wasn't it? And the Jews are always second. Yeah. And maybe that's the case also in other contexts. I mean, you spoke about Rabka and, and, and all these untold and un, really not finished stories between the nationalities and between societies. Um, same thing in Yugoslavia. And, and uh, in Piran, I mean, it, it metaphorizes this kind of violence and displacement and pushing away and taking over the property, etc. Um, and um, what was I going to say? Um, yeah, and so in a way, when you in your comment, I think you really designed the follow up research project. I don't know whether Anna would agree with me, but I mean, it would be so good to go further and to kind of cover more geographies than we than we actually did. I mean, we did go beyond, much beyond the bloodlands, yeah, much but beyond the classical Snyder Snyderian topics, and and deliberately so, yeah. But there's much to do, of course, yeah. Can I can I just briefly uh, talking about the, the the specificity of Central and Eastern Europe? I just thought that which might be not really new, but well, I I some I somehow especially when working uh, with this book had the feeling that the specificity of Central and Eastern Europe might be that we had not only the Holocaust, while the, the West is so obviously focused on the Holocaust, because that was the the most, I mean, that, that was the, the major, the central um, act of genocidal violence that happened. And that was something that was unbelievable, that one could not really, you know, um, understand and uh and that was not really um how to frame it um okay i lost my thought but what i wanted to say is that uh, for the west it was always obvious that for both the historians and the societies that the holocaust is the, the is is unique and that is the paradigm that the paradigm that should be not questioned and here the awful eastern europe comes with all the 
minor ethnic cleansing that happened uh, alongside the Holocaust. And <clears throat> while we are not trying to say in this book that uh, that the Holocaust was not unique because it was unique, what we are trying to say is that you you can uh, look at the Holocaust and at other instances of the genocidal violence or ethnic cleansing in our region, and you can compare it fruitfully, not diminishing uh, the uniqueness of the Holocaust. And I just, I, I just want to, uh, and that might be specific comparing to France or to, I don't know, wherever else, or to Belgium. Um, and I just want to bring uh, my very personal experience uh, of the peer review process, not with this book, but uh, uh, I authored a few years ago, I authored a piece, uh, a paper in the <clears throat> East, European, uh, uh, East, European, East European politics and societies. And uh, that was the piece when I introduced the very concept of the void. So what happens when the neighbors are gone? And I mean, basically, the theory that was inside and the, the attitude was the same. And that and I and I I was really heavily criticized for diminishing the uniqueness of the Holocaust. So how dare you say that certain processes might be the same? I mean, they were the same. Uh, the result was different because the the poles were not destroyed in total in many. Um, in uh, in many local communities in Ukraine, but the Jews were, but certain processes looked the same. But this is this is again Sabine. There are some statements that you should not pursue pr produce in some circumstances. And I, when working on this book, I had this feeling that uh, that saying that you that you know trying to compare uh, uh, really sensitively the Holocaust and the other instances of ethnic cleansing might be a way too provocative uh, for some audiences and it was <laughs> Sabina do you want to add something to this? Yes just very quickly because I listening I realized I, I didn't answer your question at all um, about the contribution of art and that was where I lost my thread but um, I think you're very right I mean it's it's nothing new that um, most people gain their knowledge of um, of history th rather through film than through books, like we, like our book or any book by any academic, I think. So history, I mean, Schindler's List is formative for people's knowledge about Holocaust, as, as other films are. Um, and this little film is, is, a, is a good example because it is a very local film. It is plurilingual. And as you rightly um, um, paraphrased, it was not perceived too well in Slovenia because it was deemed too friendly towards the Italians who left it was he was reproached telling the Italian story right so we're right in this okay horrible things happened but what does that mean yeah and how what do we make of it and and the film was uh, I think it, it does a marvelous job and then uh, and actually the film was uh, the beginning of this whole book project because I showed it to Anna when she was in Regensburg and the next thing I know she invites me to Warsaw right so, so it works uh, in any way, and then this, this, the book is the outcome of this initial conversation. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think I already, I already uh, told it during the other discussion about this book. But I, I really, I really remember the moment when I saw the film in in Regensburg, and uh, we were watching it with my husband. I was just constantly commenting you see you see it's like in Galicia you see it's the same it's the same <laughs> and it was so striking that I, I saw the you know the interconnections from the very beginning it was so obvious no I, I think there, there are definitely a lot of uh, similarities um and I think we can we can I think we can talk about different forms of violence um and, and genocide and genocidal violence without um, pitting one, uh, uh, presenting one as more important than the other. I, th I think we need to do that. Um, and I, because I think the Holocaust in, um, was embedded in a war that that um, facilitated and relied on violence against many different groups, right? And, and they, they were entangled. These, these forms of violence were entangled with one another. Um, <clears throat> so I'm, I'm curious to see how your book is going to be received by different scholars. Um, I haven't been able to find too many reviews, but my guess is they're still in the works. 
Um, but it will be interesting to see because it is an ongoing um, discussion. Um, and I mean, I, as you know, I'm, I'm coming more from the field of Holocaust studies. Um, it is an, an, an ongoing discussion um, as to how can we recognize the specificity of the Holocaust in different countries, because the Holocaust was unique as any other historical event is unique. Um, but it also was connected to other historical events, right? And it played out differently in different areas and it played out differently for different groups. Um, and so how can we kind of uh, reconcile that with the fact that there was violence against Belarusians, against Ukrainians, against Poles? Um, how can we reconcile that with the fact that there was violence between these different ethnic groups? How can we reconcile that with the fact that Ukrainians participated in, in rounding up their Jewish neighbors and so forth. So I think there's it's 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 a com complex situation that has not been acknowledged enough, I think, um, in, in multiple fields. And, and I think it goes in both ways. Um, and so I think there's a lot of work to do. Um, so before I open it up to, to 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 the audience, one of the things I just wanted to mention, at least, it's, it's less of a, less a question than a comment that I'm really impressed by the archive that contributors to this book have produced. Um, I mean, you, you've already mentioned testimonies as one of the central sources. And um, you, Anna, you mentioned actually you've conducted hundreds of interviews together with your team, right? Or, or your teammates have conducted hundreds of interviews. And that really is producing a new archive that, that we can work with to understand these um, processes much better and much deeper than a lot of archival documentation will ever allow us to do, right? I mean, I think this is really the shortcoming of, of many of the um, governmental um, perspective and, and, and state authorities, um, how they document um, their their doings, how we look at perpetrator documentation and so forth. Um, that that I'm I'm really um, hoping that these these testimonies, these interviews, the the ethnographic studies that you have conducted, uh, that they will be the foundation for much much more work um, be done in in that field. Um, so with that. Quantification. I want to open it up for um, questions um, to, to the audience. I hope there will be some. Uh, you can either write it in the chat or raise your hand. I think everybody can speak. It's not a webinar. Um, so plenty of time. Carolina? Yeah, hi. Um, thank you for the discussion. And I must admit at the beginning that I didn't read the book yet. Uh, so I will base my question upon what was already said. So what struck me was that there is some the, there is this like vanishing the processes of vanishing, multiple processes of vanishing, and then layers upon layers upon layers of memory of various, let's say, importance, right? Because there was this ongoing motive of what's what's for us in the time like this from the past right and i would like to ask if you happen to spot any kind of like hybrid identities that were created in these places um in place of the void right in place of those like vanishing societies What do you mean by hybrid identities? Yeah, so some kind of like new communities that used this void, that used this like vanishing processes, processes of vanishing, let's say. Some like, you know, new qualities in all those places, right? Because this was not, this is never an act of appropriation and that's it, right? But there is a kind of like neighboring with it to use the the core term of, of the book, if I understood it correctly. So if I may, um, there is, I mean, I wouldn't agree that there's totally, uh, that you, you never have this total appropriation because you you might have it. So, so somehow there is when the, the neighbors are gone and they are gone in terms, like they are physically gone, they are, they have been resettled, uh, they have been murdered um, they're, and they're gone in, in many, uh, many ways. And uh, maybe I can bring examples from my chapter um, that, yes, the neighbors were gone, properties were appropriated, and it was legitimized that they are gone um, in, in a sense that because we suffered. Um, I, so my chapter was about um, 
how the violence is remembered in the post-conflict side. So one was in today's Ukraine when the Poles were murdered, and the other one was that is currently in Poland was in Poland when Ukrainians were murdered. And how today's communities explain this disappearance and violence that um, that happened uh, in the past. And if you look at the Polish case, so there is no talking about hybrid identities in the sense. So this is a Polish place. This has been in the sense Polonized. So I'm talking about my example. Maybe there are um, other ones, but I, I would be also. I was also interested how this taking over takes place. What kind of repertoire? you need to say, okay, maybe in the past that was not entirely um, um, Polish, so to say, to refer uh, to refer to this case. But how do you explain this, uh, that it happened? Or maybe there is, maybe this is something you are not voicing. And this is like an insight from, from the fieldwork that um, me and, uh, and my colleague Magda Zatowska, when we were there, we were thinking how to ask this question, actually. Um, and, and, and I'm talking a bit about this in, uh, in the chapter, but perhaps um, if, if it, I don't know if I would understand this collect correctly, this hybrid identity, because of course they were mixed marriages, for example, in the past, and their descendants and children uh, born in the uh, mixed, mixed marriages. And if we found people who wanted to talk about this violence, there were people who had mixed um, mixed backgrounds. Uh, so they were uh, a bit um, shedding a light on, um, on what happened because it was so very much more difficult um, to ask um, ethnically Polish, in the sense, inhabitants about um, about this uh, this past. So I, I'm, I don't know if I answered your, your question here. Yes, thank you. And this is very interesting because it was said already that you were able to ask all those questions because of the opening of the archives and of this generational turn. But I think what Magorzata just said is also a valid point, right? That you were able to ask those questions because they are there are people who are able to answer because, for example, they came from mixed marriages and so on. So, yeah, thank you. Any other questions or comments? <clears throat> I might maybe try to answer or to add to this issue of hybrid identity. So maybe it's not going to be about hybrid identity, but identity, but I just want to say that um there's a there's something about functioning of the society, especially on the local level, that uh it's I mean, even if there is this attempt to clean it up uh with you know uh killing or displacing people, uh there's always something left behind, which might mean the survivors, but it might also mean the memory about the survivors who left. Uh, it might be the graves that you're looking at every morning you are going to the school. But sometimes it's also about mm -hmm. the the old neighbors who were quite smoothly replaced by the new neighbors. And uh, again, if if I uh, think about Eastern Galicia, okay, so the Jews were killed, some of the Poles were killed, some of the Poles left or were displaced, but the Ukrainians who came from from Eastern Poland, they were to replace the Poles and the and the Jews, and usually they managed to do it. Uh, sometimes not, but you when you when you look at the at the stereotypes about them, you sometimes clearly see see that they are uh, they are somehow. Uh, uh, they are developing in the way that they repeat the old stereotypes about the neighbors who are gone. Uh, I'm 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 not sure whether I'm precise enough, but you know the, there is this process of inheriting of the meaning in the in the local community. So something someone is gone, but then someone someone uh, comes to this uh, community and uh, and is taking the roles of the one who who are gone uh, so it's it's not about hybrid identity but about you know this lack of uh, 
obviousness and the lack of uh of possibility of cleaning something forever. <laughs> yeah, Margaret, what, I think what we're just, small enough that we can just what just came to my mind, um talking about I think for many of these uh, territories um there is um there's this narrative about the past and this this is something i find really interesting and really really tricky which is calling it multicultural and this idea about the past and localities being multicultural in the past and then you try to inquire but what does it actually mean and then you find out and this is not only the case of this research about uh, Wooden and Barish that I wrote about in um in but if you look at what Johanna Wurst wrote for example about um about the the case in, in the Czech Republic um and many others so what is this multicultural past and how how it kind of eclipses many uh, conflicts and uh, atrocities and um, it's not so colorful and peaceful as sometimes the this um, uh, the, the local remembrance portrays what is multicultural and this is uh, this just came to my mind because maybe this is not something hybrid uh, this is probably not what you meant by by hybrid actually but but something that emerges and tries to be um, uh, to be reconciliating in a way, talking there were different narratives about the past, but not really getting deep into what uh, what, uh, what 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 was the consequence of um, of um, of this, these encounters in the past that tend to be peaceful in many ways, yes, but tend to be violent and um, and brutal in others. Well, and I think, and I think that's something that that, that really I, I began to recognize when I was working on my book on with with oral histories of the Nazi side in Bel in Belarusia, um, is that when I conducted these interviews with with um, survivors who remained in the Soviet Union, and I spoke to them in the early two thousands, um, the the nineteen thirties emerged as this this period of internationalist promise and 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 feeling of being assimilated, being recognized as a person and it didn't matter whether you were Jewish or not. Um, well, on the other hand, we know that um, <clears throat> there was anti-Semitism in the Soviet Union. There was a massive assault on, on, on Jewish cultural life in the Soviet Union. Um, and, and to me, it often appeared, and I, and I write about that as well, is that that kind of somewhat more rosy portrayal is really a result of what came after, right? Is really a result of what then happened in the 40s with the German occupation, with the Holocaust where people were literally physically killed, um, which which is much more impactful, much more dramatic and tragic uh, than any kind of hostility or resentment or abuse, harassment you may have experienced before, right? So I think it's kind of these layers of memory that, that often kind of shape how, how different periods um, are remembered and presented afterwards. Right, that it's it's not just one one view backwards. It's not just one view and one reconstruction of the past, but there's multiple layers of reconstructing the past. And Sabina, I think what I wanted um, to say adds into that quite nicely because I was also going to speak about the dehybridization of certain regions, if you want, and specifically Istria, where the the, the state border changed. I don't know how many times during the 20th century, where the regional identity is very strong and people were very, many people were hesitant to define themselves as either Italians or Slovenes or Croatians, but the war and the fronts and then the so-called exodus after the war made it close to impossible to not be either one or the other. So you had to choose sides. And then the memory layers that went onto this now have it to be an Italian exodus and the Slovene colleagues are fighting for the narrative that includes the 20, 25 or even 30 percent of ethnic Slovenes and Croats in this exodus. That is people leaving newly communist Yugoslavia in that region, right, because they didn't want to live there. But it's become such an Italian nationalist self-victimizing narrative that even divides the Italian community because those who stayed then are the traitors and those who left are the real Italians. And whereas on the other side, all these Italians are just fascists, etc. So there is nothing hybrid about it, nothing not black and white in many of the narratives. And for decades, this was a very sensitive and not difficult to talk about topic. So I think it's it's 
it's hard to be hybrid in a region where you are forced to be either fascist or communist, where there were fronts in the war, where you are either Italian or Slavic. Um, and the Slavs are, of course, Slovenes and Croats who don't like each other sometimes equally, etc. Yeah, so it's all very complicated. But it's easy to make things easy if you want yeah, to create this, this fronts. Yeah. No, and I think in many ways that this kind of violence um, during wartime, during genocide is going to reify these identities, right? And it makes it much, much harder to destabilize them afterwards because your own experience is so much inflected by being recognized as somebody, as, 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 a, as a member of a particular group. Um, I think it was Kathy Carmichael who wrote about that in, in, in the book Genocide Before the Holocaust. Um, as as this moment where, where modernization was happening in most European societies, but at the same time we had the Armenian genocide, we had the war in in, uh, in, in Serbia and in Greek Greece before World War One, that really stabilized and that really reified these identities in a way that then laid the ground for for further violence and, and tensions in the aftermath. Right. So and I think it's it's this constant kind of. Um, reproduction of, of identities through violence, which then are the, the cause for further violence and tensions. Um, but I think what what I what I'm often worried about is that what we often also um, don't don't think about what could it look like differently, right? I mean, being of a different identities and people of different groups living together in one place should be possible. It doesn't have to end in violence and it doesn't have to end in conflict. Um, but I think there 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 is something that that we're bumping up against here is. Um, much of the political rhetoric of, of the time, even that that began um, really in, in the 19th century, where national identities were seen as competing with each other and, and not being open to, to one another. On the other hand, I think we can see identities being re refight. I'm not sure that's the right word, but I think it is um, on a daily basis in Ukraine. I mean, you have a president who stops speaking Russian because now he now he's Ukraine. Anna is shaking her head. Am I saying something stupid? No. No, no, no. You what, what you what you just said is perfectly correct because well, my thought uh, when I was listening to 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 Anika was that well, identities also tends to be created by violence, uh, influenced by the very process of violence happening because again. <laughs> People tend to speak about their own field of expertise. So I come back to Eastern Galicia in 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 many in really many um, uh, mixed Polish Ukrainian communities. The the stable ident ethnic identity of being Pole or Ukrainian didn't really exist in the way we know it now, which is kind of true. I mean, it's obvious for people who <clears throat> who who research this uh, this period and and this region, but. But the 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 well the the violence created the the identity the identity and also the survivors, uh, who left uh Ukraine after the after the war and moved to Poland, uh well they left as poles they might have not felt poles before the ethnic cleansing but the ethnic cleansing made them poles whether they wanted it or or no and that was also the case of the of many Polish Jews who. Well, they chose the Polish identity before the war, but then the, uh, the 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 Holocaust reminded them that no, no, you are not Poles, you you are Jews, and sometimes that was the moment when they, by force, rediscovered their well ethnic identity, however we define the the ethnicity, and 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 indeed, what's happening now in Ukraine is the the complete redefinition of the. Of the national identity, maybe not of the of the ethnic one, but of the national identity. Uh, and uh, while I'm I, while conducting this countless testimonies of Ukrainian refugees, the well, so many times I heard in pure Russian, you know, people who would probably never define themselves as Ukrainians before February. 2022, who spoke Russian before the war and who continue to use Russian as their well, language of convenience today. I mean, they were expressing in pure Russian this, this huge hatred towards Russia, Russians, and everything that's connected, connected with 
with Russianness and with the Russian imperialism in pure Russian. And and you see that okay, something really new happened in the in the field. And and this is something that probably Vladimir Putin never expected. I mean, he made Ukrainians many people who would never become uh, Ukrainian nationals the other way around. Uh, the the entire broad, very broad topic. But yeah, there are so many interconnections. All right, I think if there's if there's no more comments or questions, um, Anna, do you want to say some concluding words? Oh, I'm looking at Anna Topolska. <laughs> yes, yeah, yes. So, uh, thank you very much for this discussion, and I hope that this uh, will uh, encourage uh, those who haven't read the book yet, yet to read it and to uh, continue the discussions and reviews, yeah, and reviews and other conferences and and, and etc. And uh, so, thank you very much for uh, for bringing the book closer to us uh, here and uh, being our guest. So. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you all for, for joining us today. Mm -hmm. thank, and you. thank you for the invitation. Thank you for having us. Yeah, yeah and the, the, the recording will be available after uh, after after uh, 